very long passage of Scripture this morning, and because I'm not going to go through all the details, I do want to read it. And as I read it, um, I want us just to think about this again, that um, uh, Stephen is not just giving the, the leaders of Israel a history lesson. I mean, basically, they were the experts in this, this history. They understood it, but what they didn't understand was the point of it, okay? They didn't understand it was all pointing to Jesus. They also apparently didn't understand that they were also doing exactly what their forefathers did when they murmured, complained, and rejected the prophets and even put them to death and how in killing the Messiah they were doing uh, again, following in the footsteps of their fathers. And that's really the main point. That's what Stephen is bringing out here. God has blessed them, but they have rejected those blessings. They have rejected God's servants. They have rejected God. And uh, the worst thing they've done, of course, is they have killed uh, the Lord's Messiah. So the first part of this in Acts chapter 6 deals with uh, how Stephen gets arrested and then the rest of it has to do pretty much with his defense before the Jewish council and then his being the first one to give his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the first martyr, you might say, of the New Testament church. Not that the other people who died in the Old Covenant did not give their lives for Christ, but I think you understand what I'm saying. All right, so let's begin reading in uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 8, and we're going to read to the end of chapter 7. I'm going to read maybe a little quicker clip because of its length. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forth false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. The high priest said, are these things so? And he said, hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living, but he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they, were, they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave, them, he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. And from, uh, from there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph 
It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would uh, expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God. And he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. As he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us, for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the work of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who were stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You were doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. That's quite a sermon in itself, isn't it? <laughs> but again, now we want to take a, a little closer look at this. And uh, again, we're not going to comb through every detail. Obviously, this is a very long passage, but we do want to see some of the details. We want to try to get some of the points and how Stephen was essentially preaching Christ to them and uh, their rejection of their fathers and how they're following their father's footsteps. And we do have to believe that he didn't come to them simply to drill home the point that they had sinned against God. It was a John the Baptist, I think, kind of, of um, ministry. The point was to convict them of their sins so that they might turn from their sins and turn to Christ. All right, well, let's uh, begin by just taking a quick look at what we saw last time. Remember last time we saw something of a crisis that was forming within the early church. Up until that point, they enjoyed, really, the unity they enjoyed was uninterrupted. Uh, the Hellenistic Jews then began to complain, and rightly so, that their widows were going hungry. Now, remember that this was such an important need. Remember how the Lord cares for widows. But so was the ministry of the Word, that our Lord's sheep be called by His gospel. And so, in response, the apostles called the congregation together and told them to choose men, seven men, full of the Spirit and wisdom, mature men with a good reputation who could faithfully oversee this need. The men they chose were Hellenistic Jews uh, who would have, of course, a greater sensitivity to the needs of the Hellenistic widows. And because they were filled with God's Spirit, they also would be careful not to allow this to happen to the native widows. The apostles ordained them to the office of deacon. They continued to preach the word and to pray, and the kingdom of heaven continued to advance. So again, the work of the kingdom advances through this crisis, this really attack of the enemy, and then the Lord's overcoming it makes the church to be stronger. But what we want to see here this morning is again another counterattack of the enemy. This is certainly a way of looking at this. The Lord empowered Stephen who was one of the seven, by the way, both to do signs and wonders and to preach and argue for the truth of the gospel. But his ministry drew the attention of God's enemies. And of course, whenever we stand up for the truth, that's what's going to happen. And soon he was on trial for his life. Okay, Luke now gives to us the account of the first martyr. And we need to understand here that the fact that Stephen was put to death that was not a tragedy. That was not something outside of God's will. Remember the apostles, uh, Peter and John on one occasion, the, the twelve on another occasion stood before the council and indicted them on more than one occasion with murdering their Messiah. They said words just as strong as Stephen. But in this case, the Lord basically withdrew His protection from Stephen so that Stephen would be put to death. Because this is how the Lord had determined that Stephen would glorify him with his life. And we need to be able to say when the Lord uses us for purposes like this, that his will be done because he knows what is best. Now, first we see Stephen's powerful ministry that leads to his arrest. And again, we want to just notice when we stand up for Jesus, we also stand out and our enemies will take note. It will draw attention, okay? Apparently, Stephen, who was the deacon, had gifts to go beyond this original calling. And as he was faithful in the little which the Lord had given him to do, which was really very important work, again, there's really no small work in the kingdom of heaven, the Lord gave him more. Now, I think we see from this that the Lord will first empty us of ourselves before He will use us, really before He can use us. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples as they were jockeying for position on one occasion? He says, if you want to be great in His kingdom, you need to become the servant of all. And He pointed to Himself as the example. The one who is God becomes man in order to become a servant, in order to lift us to heaven. When we, by God's grace, can reach the point where no task is too small for us, 
when we can say, not my will, but your will be done, then we're really in a position where the Lord can use us. And you know, He's not going to use us until we reach that position. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, the Lord had filled Stephen with grace and power. Again, the same power of the Holy Spirit, which is available to us today through Jesus, but we have to seek for it in more than just a simple prayer. Lord, please give me your spirit. It's got to be an earnest seeking. It has to be a desire to do His will. We need to be engaged in the work. We need to be giving ourselves up and humbling ourselves in order to serve Him. That power is available. But Stephen also had a power that isn't available to us. He was performing great signs and wonders among the people. And understanding that these signs and wonders were never actually done as an end in themselves to make people marvel and you just kind of move on and do a sign somewhere else so more people can marvel. But rather as a means of authenticating God's word, we need to understand that Stephen here was preaching the gospel. And he was doing these signs to prove to the Jews that this message he was bringing was from God. Now, it wasn't very long before this ministry caught the attention of particular Jews who were antagonistic toward the gospel. Luke writes in verse 9 of chapter 6, But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Now, these Jews, notice, were all Hellenistic Jews as well. They were all basically from outside of Palestine. Uh, perhaps some of them, you know, some have argued that maybe we have represented here representatives from five different synagogues. Maybe there were two different synagogues. But it's also possible they were all from the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, this means, essentially, that they had either formerly been slaves as Jews were basically born slaves in the Roman Empire, and then had been freed, or like Paul, they were actually free born. Now, notice one of the places that, uh, where the people were from who were a part of this synagogue, uh, Cilicia. That's where Tarsus was in Cilicia. Some believe that Paul was actually a member of this synagogue. And it's interesting that he is present when Stephen is being stoned, and that seems to strengthen that view. Um, these were all, again, Hellenistic Jews, and this may be why they're arguing with Stephen. Here is a Hellenistic Jew who's converted to Christianity, and here are those who see that he's basically one of them, and they begin to attack him. Well, now that the Lord had their attention, he empowers Stephen actually to enter into debate with them. But he spoke with such power and with such wisdom that they could not refute him. I want you to notice one thing here, that what Stephen is doing is really what the Lord is calling us to do, basically to tell others about the gospel and then to argue for the truth of the gospel. That's what apologetics is all about. Remember again what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and we have to believe Stephen had those virtues, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Be ready to argue the point. That's what Stephen was doing. But notice also that Stephen was doing it with a wisdom and a power that was beyond that, perhaps, of, of our, our natural abilities. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 15, to His disciples that He would give them utterance and wisdom which none of their opponents would be able to resist or refute. Well, here we see that promise being fulfilled in Stephen. Now, again, our Lord wants us to be ready to evangelize, to be prepared at all times to make use of the opportunities He gives to us. But he also wants us to be ready to defend the gospel and to defend the honor of Christ because of those who are going to dishonor him as we share his lordship and his command that they repent and believe in him and bow the knee to Jesus. But when we do that, know also the Lord will be with us. He has promised that he will be with us. But now winning arguments can also have consequences. When they saw that they could not outmaneuver him, 
they took the easy way out and tried to frame him instead, and apparently they were successful. Verse 11, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. The same thing they did in the case of Jesus. They couldn't find any grounds on which to accuse him, so they trumped up charges. So they rallied the people, the elders and the scribes, they dragged him before the council, charging him with speaking out against the temple. Remember the temple that Jesus said he was going to destroy in 70 AD? That's probably what he was doing. And the law that he was going to, that is, Jesus was going to change the traditions. And as a matter of fact, Jesus did change those traditions. He did by fulfilling the ceremonial law. So these charges may not necessarily have been entirely trumped up, but they were used, of course, as a means of slander, and they were used as a means to, um, to incite the council to destroy him. Now, as the council listened to these charges, they gazed at Stephen, expecting to see maybe fear, maybe to see some guilt in his eyes, but instead seeing an innocent and serene face, basically peace, right? like that of the holy angels, again, showing that God was with him, the Spirit was with him, giving him grace to be able to go through this without being terrified. Now, again, this reminds us that God is true to his word. God will give us peace. He will give us strength when we are persecuted for his cause. We do not need to be afraid. All right, so Stephen's been arrested. And now he's before the council. Secondly, we see Stephen's reply which is both defensive and offensive. And by the way, um, you know, it's often said that uh, the, the sermons that are represented within the Bible are perhaps all abbreviated. Otherwise, uh, we have some fairly short sermons. And this one only took maybe, I don't know, a little more than maybe between five and ten minutes to read. So that's not very long. It's, it's likely the sermon went longer than this. Uh, by the way, there's also grounds for a longer sermon. It's, it's believed that uh, the book of Hebrews is itself a sermon, and it's 13 chapters, and it takes quite a bit longer to read. But anyway, so it, we, we shouldn't assume this is just the only thing that Stephen said, but he did say quite a bit. And one thing we want to note as we go through this section is, again, that Stephen is not just rehearsing the history of Israel. There's a point behind it, and the point is this. God has given them great blessings and privileges, especially now in the gospel dispensation. But like their fathers, they have rejected them, and so they will face God's judgment if they do not repent and turn to Jesus. And I'm sure if Stephen had, given, had been given the opportunity to continue his sermon instead of being cut short, that is the direction he was heading. He wasn't just trying to drive nails through them. He was trying to get them to repent and to trust in Jesus. Now, we're not going to go through all the details, but again, just try to get the overarching message. Now, he begins with Abraham because this is where the Jewish nation begins with Abraham, God's call to Abraham. Out of all the people of the earth, the Lord chose him to make his covenant with him. And why? Because Abraham was such a righteous guy? No, the Bible says that Abraham was dug out of a pit like everyone else was in the pit, but God had mercy upon him and brought him out of the pit. God gave Abraham his mercy even though he did not deserve it. And in his mercies, he gave to Abraham that promise to give him the land of Canaan, as many children as the stars in the heavens, and that through his seed, through the Messiah, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, this is the first great privilege that God has given to the Jewish nation. They existed because of God's having mercy on Abraham, because of his promise to Abraham, because they, well, I should say they possessed the land because of the covenant he made with Abraham. To them, he sent the Messiah first to save them from their sins, again, because of God's mercy upon Abraham. They are a privileged people. They had the promises. That's one thing that is really emphasized in especially Presbyterian circles. I mean, you've heard this before, right? Is, is the idea that God says, I will be a God to you and to your children after you, and the promises belong to them. As, as again, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, for the promises to you and to your children. And the reason is because 
God made the promise to Abraham and to his children, and that's the point that he's making right here. But he goes on to say this, before Abraham's children could possess this land, there were two things that needed to happen. First, the people who lived in Canaan, which is the land he was giving to them, they had to finish filling up the cup of God's wrath. Now, what I'm doing is explaining what's behind all of this, okay? God was being patient with them, but his patience was coming to an end. That was still going to take some time, which is why the Lord is giving time. Second, his people needed to grow in number uh, so that they could conquer the peoples of Canaan. And they needed to grow in obedience, the kind of obedience you can only learn through trials. They needed to be sorted out, so to speak. That also would take time. So the Lord told Abraham that his children would dwell in a foreign land and be enslaved for 400 years. Think about Egypt before he would bring them into the promised land. Now, to show Abraham that he would do all that he said he would do, he gave him the covenant of circumcision. He put his mark of ownership on Abraham and upon his children that would remind them of the promises, but also the change of heart that he was going to give them through the Messiah if they would simply trust in him. So again, great, great privileges. Now, to prepare them to bring them into this foreign land, the Lord used the evil that was in Joseph's brothers and in their hearts to sell him as a slave into Egypt. There God raised him up as a second, basically second only to Pharaoh, and to make him a picture or a type of Jesus Christ. Joseph is very much a type of Jesus. He is the one who delivered God's people from the famine, right, that the Lord was going to send upon the earth. Now, here's another blessing God gives to His children as a whole. He gives them a deliverer, Joseph, and He gives them a deliverance. He provides for them while they're in Egypt. But here we also see the first in a series of examples that Stephen is going to use to indict the Jewish leaders. How did Joseph's brothers treat him? Not too well. They hated him. They rejected him. They wanted to kill him. But instead, they sold him to Midianites who then sold him to a secular power. Do you realize that the Jews treated Jesus in essentially the same way? They hated him, rejected him, handed over him to the Romans in order to kill him. So again, the first indictment against the Jewish leaders. Now next, the Lord sends a famine. When Jacob heard there was food in Egypt, and there was only food in Egypt because the Lord had given Joseph wisdom to store up food, because of the dream that was given to Pharaoh. He sent his sons to, in order to buy some grain. And on the second trip, Joseph made himself known to them, invited them to come to Egypt where he would provide for them. And so they came, notice, 75 persons in all. That's a pretty small group of people needed to get a little bit larger before he gives them the land of Canaan because of the need to do battle and to keep up the land, as it were, so they, they needed, there needed to be more. So he brings them into Egypt. There Jacob dies, and so did his sons. But of course, because he believed God's promise that he would give the land of Canaan to his people, he ordered his body to be buried in Shechem, which is in Canaan. Now here, I think, by way of positive example, is a righteous man. Notice he believed God is faithful. He believed God is good, which of course he is. And so he trusted him and he acted upon the promises of God, even as Abraham did about things not yet seen. And he made orders concerning his body that it be buried in the promised land. When God brings you into the land, Joseph will do exactly the same thing. But here was another rebuke to the Jewish leaders. They did not believe God. They did not act upon his promises. They have rejected God's purpose for them. But as the time approached when God would give them the land, He blessed His people and He caused them to multiply. Another king ascended the throne in Egypt who did not know Joseph. And because he was afraid of the Jews, he enslaved them. And he ordered that their male children be killed. It was into this situation the Lord sent another Messiah another deliverer, another type or picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is, of course, Moses. After three months in his parents' house when they could no longer hide him, he was put out, as you know, on the Nile and brought in by um, Pharaoh's daughter. 
schooled in the learning of the Egyptians, notice powerful in words and deeds, which seems kind of strange because Moses was the first one to object that he could not speak well. Apparently, he could, but not as well as Aaron. Maybe it was a little bit of trepidation on his part. Who am I to stand before Pharaoh? So here is this man prepared by the Lord. On his first attempt to deliver his people by killing the Egyptian who had mistreated one of his people, that ended in his running away to the land of Midian because his people rejected him. But 40 years later, the Lord called him from the burning bush and sent him back into Egypt to lead his people out through signs and wonders. Stephen points out, this is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, another deliverer who would save them from God's wrath, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here are two more great privileges, the deliverer Moses, whom God gave to them to deliver them from Egypt, and the promise of the even greater deliverer, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Moses also received God's law, and he gave that law to them, the law that they cherished so much because they saw it as the way that they could be reconciled with God. But again, how did their fathers respond to this kindness that God showed them? They refused to follow Moses. In their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron to make a golden calf, and they proclaimed a feast to the Lord. And so God turned them over to serve their idols, telling them that one day He would send them basically beyond Babylon. And as a matter of fact, that's what the Lord did. Their fathers, again, rejected the Lord's deliverer and His law. And of course, that's what these Jewish leaders were also doing. Now, we're, we're getting around to the main point here. Yet God blessed them further, okay? He gave them the tabernacle, which they, they brought with them into the land. By the way, you know that the reason why He gave them a tabernacle to begin with and not a temple was because it would be harder to move a temple than it would be a tabernacle. You know, they're still moving around in the wilderness and they didn't have a permanent place. But once they did, they brought the tabernacle into the land when God gave them the land through Joshua. And once they were settled, He gave them the temple, the more permanent house of God. David wanted to build the temple, Stephen tells us, but it was Solomon who built it because Solomon was a man of peace. Now, this is the temple that Stephen had been saying that Jesus said was going to be torn down, and that's one of the things he was sort of under fire for. This tabernacle, this temple, we know was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a picture of Jesus through its cleansing ceremonies and sacrifices, even through its partitions that kept the people away from God's presence lest they die because God is holy. It taught them of their need of the Lord Jesus Christ to take away their sins so that they might be reconciled to God. The temple was also meant to teach them that as Solomon had, had built the physical temple out of stones, that the Messiah or the Lord Jesus Christ would build His spiritual temple made of living stones. The temple is not just a picture of Jesus. The temple is a picture or a type of the church. As Stephen tells us, God never intended to dwell in a temple that was made with, with hands, not in a, a building, but he, was, he intended to live in one made without hands, in His living temple, in Christ as the head, and in His people as the living stones that make up this sanctuary. And Stephen is saying, now that the Lord Jesus Christ has come, the temple has done its job. It's no longer necessary. It's going to be torn down because Jesus has come, because the way into the holy place has been revealed. The, the veil has been torn when Jesus, when His flesh was also torn. So the Jews had missed really the whole point of, of the entire Old Testament message, right? It was all pointing to Jesus, all these pictures of deliverance, all these mercies of God, all these deliverers, and then finally this temple. They missed the whole point. It was all pointing to Jesus, the one they had killed. But Stephen has one final indictment against them, and it's this. 
As their fathers had resisted the Holy Spirit, so did they. As their fathers had killed the prophets who had announced the coming of the Messiah, so they had betrayed and murdered the Messiah. You know, it seems like they were actually more put out by the very last thing that he said than everything else that came before it. You who receive the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. They didn't keep the law at any point. This is the thing that they really prided themselves on is they were righteous men because they kept the law. But they didn't keep the law. That's what Stephen is telling them. And particularly by their murdering God's son. They put not only an innocent man to death, they put the Lord of glory to death. God had been so gracious to them, and this is how they repaid him. Now, again, um, Stephen meant this to be a conviction. You know, the law comes before gospel, doesn't it, to show you your need? They, they thought they were righteous. Jesus said, you know, it's not those who are well who need the physician, but those who are sick have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So the law is brought in to show people their sickness, to show them the fact that they are guilty and they are sinners. And that's what Stephen was doing with the intent, of course, to strengthen the gospel. I mean, he was bringing the gospel in with it because I think they were already aware of what they were teaching regarding the Messiah. But notice, finally, their response against Stephen. The same response they gave to Christ. What Stephen said, cut them to the quick. This message was meant to convict them that they might turn to Jesus, but instead they became furious. Well, I've never seen that happen before, have you? Where you tell somebody that they've done what they've done wrong and they get angry at you? I mean, that's how most people respond unless the Lord changes the heart. And of course, Stephen didn't know whether the Lord was going to change their hearts or not, but whether he did or not, he was still going to tell them the truth. If God does not change the heart, this truth will only harden people. It will only incite them. But again, that's the way it works. But being filled now with the Holy Spirit, Stephen looked into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, we know from the author to the Hebrews, we know from Psalm 110 that when our Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life and he was raised again to life, that he ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, waiting from that time on until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Jesus is seated in the seat of honor, in the seat of power, but here we see him standing. And I think that's significant because he was standing to receive his faithful servant who was about to die. Now, they were even more incensed by the fact that he said that he could see Jesus in heaven, this one that they hated so much. And so they dragged him outside the city and they began stoning him. And notice that Luke adds this, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, we noted earlier that Saul was likely of the synagogue of the freedmen. You know, he was one who was born free, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which is in Asia Minor. He is a Hellenistic Jew, and that's where these people were actually from. You know, it probably wouldn't be too much of a stretch to, to think that Paul was actually there with the, these other Jews debating Stephen and being Hellenistic this might explain why the Lord later saves him and calls him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Because being a Hellenistic Jew, he lived among the Gentiles his whole life, unlike the Jews that were isolated in, in Palestine. Now, as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen calls upon the Lord Jesus to receive his spirit. He also prayed for his murderers that the Lord might have mercy upon them. And then he fell asleep. Now again, here we have, as I've said, we have the, our first martyr, Stephen. And here I believe that this is recorded for us as an example to us. It's recorded to us, of course, for the content and the message. Uh, but it shows us what it is that the Lord desires within us. And let's combine this with what we saw at the beginning in our meditation that if we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be willing to take up our cross and follow Him. 
that we must not hold on to our lives, but be willing to let go of them in order that we might give glory to Him. Well, that's exactly what we see in Stephen. Stephen was a man of faith. He believed what the Bible said. And he was a faithful man. He did what the Lord told him in His Word to do. He fearlessly bore witness to the gospel. And he defended it publicly. He brought a convicting message against the Jewish leaders again, hoping that the Lord might grant them repentance, but knowing that He might not and that they might kill Him. But He still did it. And, of course, when they stoned Him, He didn't cry out for vengeance, which you would imagine you would be tempted to do, but He prayed that God might have mercy on them. Now, again, does that remind you of anyone? The Lord Jesus, right? He did exactly the same thing. And as we are called to follow the example that Jesus has given to us, this is what he would have us also to do. The fact that Stephen did it means that it is possible. And the fact that Paul, if you've read 2 Corinthians lately and you see the catalog of things he went through for the gospel, it shows us that there were people who actually did this, who actually were persecuted. They were willing to do what the Lord called them to do. It's It's possible, okay? It's possible to do this. God has given us His Spirit so that we might. So this morning, again, I just want us to be encouraged by Stephen's example. Not to be afraid of man, but to trust God, to trust Him to do what God said He would do. Remember how He promised His his disciples and how we see in Stephen He fulfilled all of those promises And the reason is because God is faithful. God is one who can be trusted. He is trustworthy. And so we should move forward in the work that the Lord has called us to do, even if it should cost us our lives because of God's faithfulness. We know the worst thing that can happen to us is that we lose our lives like Stephen lost his. But if that happens the Lord will take us to be with Him, which Stephen knows and Paul knew even while on earth is very much better than anything that we happen to be holding on to in this world here. This is, again, an encouragement to us to be willing to give our lives for the Lord. So may the Lord grant us mercy that we might be able to do this by His grace. All right, well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and as we do, let's prepare to come to the table and in preparing to come to the table, let's let the Lord search our hearts with this passage. Um, just again, that, um, you know, are we willing to pay this price? Would we be willing to do what Stephen did? Is, is that how far our commitment to the Lord goes? Well, that's, that's how far it, it needs to go. So let's pray God would also give us grace to be willing to pay this price. If we haven't been willing up to this point, or if we have been, that we would continue to be willing to do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, um, I, I don't think we have to be reminded that this passage, this example, uh, calls us to a very high standard, and yet we have an example that calls us to an even higher standard, and that is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we understand that you do not call us to follow this example in our own strength in order that we might enter into